Uh, there we go. And with that, I'd like to introduce Susan Gilliland, who will introduce our speakers for tonight. Susan. Okay, thank you, Ron. Well, Los Angeles Birders is very pleased to welcome back John Dunn and Kimball Garrett. John and Kimball have started birding at a very young age. They met on a field trip to the Carrizo Plains and have been friends ever since. Today, Kimball and John are two of North America's most accomplished birders and leading authorities on all things birds. Kimball is the Ornithology Collections Manager at the Los Angeles Natural History Museum and has held that position since 1982. John is a senior tour leader for Wings Birding Tours and is the current president of Western Field Ornithologists. Together, John and Kimball have authored several books, including Birds of Southern California, Status and Distribution, The Birds of the Los Angeles Region, and The Field Guide to Warblers. Tonight, John and Kimball are here to help us sort out the dark-eyed junco puzzles, a species with great variation. So without further ado, let's give a warm welcome to John Dunn and Kimball Garrett. Hi folks, I guess we're gonna talk about uh, druggy birds tonight with juncos. Uh, um, this is a kind of a typical Garrett Dunn production and that we've spent a, a number of years talking about it, various issues involved and typically haven't made much progress. And as we age, the progress has been increasingly slow, but we agreed to do this. so. That galvanizes us into at least coming up with um, some slides that Kimball put together and uh, discuss the some of the salient issues that interest us. Not sure how much resolution we'll bring, but um, hopefully it'll at least get you thinking on some issues. Um, when we talk about juncos and where they fit in. Uh, fox sparrows and the zona trichia sparrows, so uh, passerella at the genus and also um, zona trichia, so the white crowned white throated sparrow. Juncos are somewhere in that uh, clade, so to speak, uh, relationships. And it's worth pointing out that at least within the slate colored group, uh, within um, the nominate hymalis, there's a, quite a few known hybrids between slate colored junco and white throated sparrow, uh, which likely reflects at least a familiarity between the two or an attraction, can't say for sure. There's a couple of other things, uh, lad in due course, but the if there are three sort of take home messages to think about in this, uh, with we have various degrees of clarity. One is we, want to think more, everyone say, oh, that's the Oregon subspecies. There's seven subspecies in the Oregon group. We need to do better than that. Uh, it's a whole cluster of subspecies. It's the Junko group with the most subspecies. And so we want to introduce that subject. Uh, secondly, Kimball will discuss the whole relationship within the gray-headeds, the uh, caniceps, the traditional gray-headed and the Dorsalis uh, from the Mogian Rim across to the Guadalupe Mountains of Texas. And those two, and particularly the, the latter, with the whole yellow eyed group and what that might all mean in terms of uh, speciation and relationships. And then finally, and perhaps the most easy subject to resolve, is the complete mess within the understanding of the pink side of Junko. Um, uh, that's the easiest to separate and yet the most misunderstood because it's so been so completely uh, misrepresented in field guides. Uh, so those are multiple subspecies of Oregon chuncos to see if we can put out some ideas, the gray-headed yellow-eyed group and the pink-sided. So those are the three. And I'm gonna turn it over to Kimball. Okay, um, I hope my slides will advance reasonably quickly. So if they have, you should now be seeing a list of every species within the genus junk that means five of them. Um, the number of species, of course, has been in flux for a long time, depending on people's taxonomic leanings. Um, but 
these are uh, the current AOS taxonomy recognizes these five species. The volcano junco is essentially endemic to Costa Rica and barely into Western Panama. We won't really say anything much more about that other than it's the only junco without white outer tail feathers. Um, recently split for a long time considered part of the dark-eyed junco complex is the Guadalupe junco, which is endemic to Guadalupe Island, off, well off from the coast of Western Mexico. Um, and we'll come back to some of these and essentially the pattern of their evolution in just a minute. And then right here in the middle is, of course, the familiar and most widespread junco species, the dark-eyed junco, which includes several subspecies groups. And our main emphasis tonight will be talking about these subspecies groups um, and to some extent variation as in the Oregon junco within the groups. Then the yellow-eyed junco, uh, sometimes known as the Mexican junco, is widespread from sort of the border states, southeast Arizona, southwest New Mexico, south all the way to Guatemala. And there is some um, pretty distinct genetic differences in some of the southern populations, even though phenotypically they all are more or less similar to one another. And then finally, the Baird's junco, which is endemic to the Cape District of Highlands of Baja, California. So don't get confused. We're going to be talking later about two Oregon junco subspecies in the northern mountain ranges of Baja, California. But the Baird's is very distinct, um, seemingly closer to the yellow eye and um, certainly not one of the dark eyed juncos. So these are currently at least the five recognized species of in the genus Junco. So just some general characteristics. Um, again, we have the advantage of talking about a kind of bird that's very familiar to all of you. We all see lots of Oregon Juncos on the breeding grounds around here. And of course, in the winter, a nice mix of subspecies and subspecies groups. So um, it's not like we're uh, off in outer space talking about something not familiar to people. Just some general characteristics of all juncos. The juveniles are streaked below. They have a very distinctive plumage, but you're only going to see that plumage on the breeding ground. So they undergo their preformative molt, their first, what used to be called first pre-basic molt uh, on the breeding grounds. Now, sure, you might get some showing some juvenile plumage a bit away from the breeding grounds, but you really only expect them on the breeding grounds. In general, sexual dimorphism plumage at least in juncos is minor, but can be moderate. It often involves saturation of browns and other colors and how dark the head is. We'll be talking a little more about that, but it, it's not striking, it's, it's minor to moderate. Again, in terms of molts, it's pretty simple. They have a partial uh, preformative molt, as I mentioned on the breeding grounds. The pre-basic molt of adults is complete, taking place after the breeding season from June to October. And the pre-alternate molt is very limited. So in other words, juncos are not gonna change their appearance much from winter to the breeding season. Uh, juncos generally are ground nesters, although it's interesting that some recently adapted urban populations have begun to nest a bit higher up off the ground. Um, and the degree to which they migrate varies with the subspecies and the population. Some are largely resident, uh, some are partial or short distance migrants, and some will migrate longer distances. Because of these partial to long distance migrations, you'll often see a great deal of mixing of taxa in winter flocks. Uh, again, just continuing with some general characteristics, they're all basically the same size, but there is a gradient from the largest, which would be the white winged junco. At least this is within the dark eyed junco species. Uh, to the smallest, which would be the widespread northern ones, the slate colored and Oregon juncos. Bill size likewise varies somewhat. Um, it, it's strikingly large and white winged, looks pretty big and red backed, tends to be smallest in the northern migratory groups like slate colored and Oregon. On the ground, you've all watched juncos, they hop around, and pick at the ground for seeds and things. It's interesting though that yellow-eyed juncos have a distinctive kind of shuffling walk. It's not like the hop, typical hopping of dark-eyed juncos. And I think uh, John can weigh in on this later, but 
some have speculated perhaps red back juncos got something of a shuffle to its walk. I can't say I've noticed that one way or the other, but it's some, certainly something to investigate. In general, uh, you've heard juncos singing. Their songs are pretty simple trills. Uh, they can vary quite a bit, but it's generally a simple trilled pattern. Um, often very suggestive of a chipping sparrow song, although it can be much more musical. However, yellow-eyed juncos have a much more complex song and redback, in fact, at least in parts of their range, uh, have a song that is somewhat closer to yellow-eyed in its complexity. And just a final note that's kind of an aside, <clears throat> an aside here is that some populations of dark-eyed juncos have dramatically expanded their range into urban areas. So for example, our local thurber eye Oregon juncos now nest pretty much throughout the coastal sl slope of Southern California, although formerly limited more to wooded mountain and upper foothill areas. And so they breed, for example, right down to the coast in San Diego County, Orange County, LA County, and so on. And this has been a dramatic expansion just in the last couple of decades. And some interesting studies have been taking place about these urban juncos. They really seem to like college campuses and they've become one of the most abundant familiar birds on campuses like UC Irvine, UCLA, UC San Diego, and so on. I, I don't know why, I guess they're really into education. So here's an overview. I'm just gonna continue with a little bit of overview of juncos and then John will take over and talk about um, the Oregon complex first and then we'll go on from there. Uh, this is from a paper by Freeze et al. Um, uh, just a few, <clears throat> few years back. Um, they, that's part of a group of researchers, including Borja Mila, who was at UCLA for a long time, who have really looked into the evolutionary history of juncos. So these are the breeding ranges of the groups that we'll talk about. Um, I don't know if you'll see my cursor moving around, but you can certainly see the colors. So <clears throat> the widespread boreal subspecies or, the, or subspecies group is the slate colored, all the way from Western Alaska to the Canadian uh, Eastern Canada seaboard. So it is incredibly widespread geographically. Um, there is a, another subspecies, Carolinensis in the Appalachians of slate colored. The Oregon group, of course, is essentially a Pacific coast group breeding from Southeast Alaska uh, through much of British Columbia, Washington, Oregon, and California into Northern Baja. And then some more restricted groups. Uh, pink sided is, is largely sort of in the Idaho this, this general area of the West. White wing, very limited to a small area, um, including the Black Hills, South Dakota, and a few ranges west of there. The gray-headed, essentially a Great Basin subspecies. Uh, the, that's Caniceps. And then the red-backed junco, or Dorsalis, is, as John mentioned, the Mogollon Rim um, into extreme north, extreme western Texas, the Guadalupe Mountains. Um, and then the Baird's Junco, uh, endemic to the Cape District of Baja, the Guadalupe Junco on Guadalupe Island. And then the Yellow Eye Junco is essentially from the, our border states down through middle America. There are some variants down there which are genetically quite distinct and probably have a long history of evolutionary separation, even though they all look more or less the same. So the Guatemalan Junco, Alticola, the Chiapas Junco fulvescens. And then finally, the last species we briefly mentioned before is the Volcano Junco, which is virtually endemic to Costa Rica, barely gets into Western Panama. So these are the players in the story that we'll be talking about tonight. You can't talk about juncos and their evolution and their species and subspecies relationships without a nod to Alden Miller who wrote this uh, incredible monograph, Speciation in the Avian Genus Junco, um, published in 1941, specimen-based research and, and incredible scholarship. Alden Miller was born in 1906. He was the son of Loy Miller, who was a well-known biologist and paleontologist uh, from Southern California. Um, in fact, uh, sadly, actually, um, Loy Miller outlived his son Alden, who died in 1965. Uh, he got his undergraduate degree from UCLA, and then Alden Miller got his PhD under Joseph Brunel, and you all are familiar with the, the names 
Grinnell and Miller because of their incredible work on the distribution of the birds of California, published in 1944 after Grinnell died. He was curator at the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology from the 40s to the 60s to when he died, editor of the Condor for a long time, and a longtime member of the AOU Checklist Committee, uh, now the AOS Checklist Committee, and the chair of that committee for the last five years of his life. So an um, incredible biologist and this Junko monograph is, is absolutely required reading for anybody who's interested in the subject. It's the University of California Publications in Zoology. Uh, even Ernst Meyer had good things to say about it. Birds, only a few good studies have been made on population differences within subspecies and on the variation in the zone of contact between two subspecies. Alda Miller's study of junco populations, 1941, is perhaps the finest study of the sort in the ornithological literature. And that's pretty high praise coming from uh, Ernst Meyer. So uh, get your hands on that publication. There's, there's a lot in it. Um, um, I'm going to sort of skip by this pretty quickly, but the juncos have a very interesting evolutionary history, which is being sorted out through genetic work in, in really just the last decade, uh, less than the last decade, again, through this group, uh, Borja Mila and his co-authors. And this chart on the right shows the, the evolutionary relationships among the various junco groups. Now, some of these uh, distinctions are statistically not all that robust. So when once you get up into the dark eyed juncos, I wouldn't take this too literally, but you can see how essentially from the ancestral juncos in Central America, you have these long branches leading to the Chiapas junco, um, Alticola, which is even outside of this graph, and then onto the yellow eyed junco populations. So they've had a long history of evolutionary separation. And pretty much after the evolution or the Split of yellow-eyed juncos into the dark-eyed complex, you had an incredibly rapid evolution of all these different groups of juncos. So you see the red-backed coming off here, then gray-headed, um, and then all of the, uh, the dark-eyed juncos up here. And the, really all the, all the subspeciation and speciation, well, speciation, if you want to call it that, in the dark-eyed junco is taken place only in the last few tens of thousands of years. So it's been a very incredible, incredibly rapid expansion and differentiation. And then the interesting thing is the phenotypic differences among all these Northern forms is very striking and much more subdued in these more middle American forms, even though they have had a much longer history of evolutionary separation. So uh, you might wanna look at some of these publications because they're, they're really quite interesting. So having given that background about juncos in general, and John can fill in anything important that I forgot to mention, we'll turn it back over to John and he can talk about the Oregon group and then we'll work into some of the other groups. John? Kimball, thank you. Well, the Oregon group, that's the most dominant of uh, the subspecies groups, certainly in Southern California. Um, oh, greater than 90% of the juncos we encounter are that belong to that group. Uh, the widespread breeder is Thurberi uh, that encompasses all of Southern California, really much of California, except for the more humid central coast and, and adjacent interior regions, Penosis, uh, which seems to be pretty resident. Uh, now, it would be a mistake to say that all the Oregon juncos we see are Thurberi. Um, and that's the subject that is causing me the, the most interest in the last few years, maybe the most consternation. Um, I believe the great majority of the birds we have here in the winter, and winter is just coming on now, uh, pertain to an interior northern race, Schufeldi. Uh, which um, seems to the males have a slightly less blackish hood, um, a little paler overall, duller, uh, although more richly cinnamon on the back, perhaps the sides and flanks, more tannish color on Thurberi. But I think most of the winter flocks here, at least in the lowlands of the Owens Valley, are not Thurberi. But males, males you can tell by blackish or, or sooty black heads, Females 
more grayish. Uh, the more southerly subspecies are darker uh, in both the males and females. One of the great difficulties is um, judging and interpreting the colors people give them. So you read on one subspecies, coffee brown or rich coffee brown, or for the sides and flank, pinkish tan or pinkish or cinnamon. It occurred to me that one of the great steps forward might be someone like Phil Unit, who's opined on this within the Oregon group and used different words to describe over time the same subspecies would be to do something like Dan Gibson did in his inventory for Alaska and Western birds and show a series of specimens that basically identify which subspecies you're looking at. So we say here, Oregonus group, likely shoe felt eye, um, but we're really just guessing. So let's carry on. Advance. I have lost my arrows on my screen to advance. So I'm, nothing is happening. I don't know. Hey, we're gonna look at this Oregon Junko for a good long Frank, while. Frank, any tech support from Frank or somebody? You should just click on the slide down in the corner and uh, they should come up. There they are. Okay, now they've, now they've come up. They went away for a while. So yeah, give it a second and maybe it'll advance. Okay, this is the next slide. I'm still seeing the same slide. Well, no, the same picture. Okay, all Oregon juncos have this convex rather than concave shape of the most widespread group, the slate colored group. So a hooded effect, sharply cut off. The males with really jet black as in Thurberi or black or dark slate, mm -hmm. blackish hoods, females grayer. And then the differences, addition to the head color, deal with the exact shades of color on the back and on the flanks. Can you advance, Kimball? There we are. And more about the, um, the songs we compared to Chipping Sparrow, but that's typical of all of the dark eyes except uh, Dorsalis. When you, like this morning I was spishing, they give a hard dit call uh, when they're excited or a rapid twittering is conspicuous. Um, the, um, the call of black throated blue warbler is compared to a junco call. Okay. We say probably Thurberi, and I say that based on the sides and back contrast. Here's a female Oregon junco. The head's more grayish. The sides and flanks uh, are more richly colored, we think, than. Uh, Thurberi, more cinnamon colored. This one's almost concave in pattern. Uh, Lance had a good comment that um, Pine Warbler's song is easily confused with Junko's too. Fortunately, not a, a big issue here in Southern California. So we have seven subspecies, not including Mern's Eye, the pink sided, which we'll talk about later, um, which is sometimes put in the Oregon group as by Miller. Two are restricted to Northern Baja, California. Uh, there is a side comment that one of those, the one in Townsend Eye in the San Pedro Martir has been placed with uh, pink sided uh, by Dwight and uh, Howell, Howell and Webb, but uh, that makes no biogeographical bio sense. And uh, that's likely, uh, not correct. Anyway, California is the Thurberi is the widespread California breeder, except for Pinosis on the central California coast. It's our opinion that Schufeld eye is the dominant wintering bird of the interior. Next image. So 
the old first name within this group was Organus, uh, named by Townsend, and it breeds southeast Alaska, western British Columbia, the cold, humid northwest coast. Its winter range goes south to California. Uh, it's basically rare farther south or east. And when we look at some slides of specimens, it's a very dark subspecies, the males with very black hoods, the backs with very dark cinnamon backs. Uh, Phillips didn't like most of Miller's claims of oregonus for Arizona. Next image. So that's the first named. <coughs> and then we get into something that's really quite confusing. Uh, the coastal Washington race is named Sibelimus by Phillips. By the AOU 57, it's shoe fell tie. And it took me a number of times to sort this out. The problem comes with the type specimen of shoe fell dye thought to represent the Western Washington birds, which is from New Mexico. I believe it's a female. And Phillips decided it fit more within the interior birds. And thus the interior birds became shoe felt, shoe fell dye. And what Ridgeway named a decade later as Montanus disappears as a name. And hence the confusion, you'll see a lot of even recent references referring to Montanus, but that equals Schufeldi. To further um, muddle or perhaps simplify things is that uh, the birds from coastal Washington are very similar to these interior Northern birds, but a little more richly colored. So maybe Similimus disappears as a name too. Uh, in any case, uh, let's move on. But anyway, it's those northern interior birds that I think predominate here. So here's the range of Thurberi. It's basically sometimes, um, can we go back? Yeah, there we are. Sometimes Phillips calls it the Sierra Junco. That's where a large part of the range is, but it also breeds in all the mountains of Southern California and increasingly in the lowlands. Um, we're sort of confused. To, we need to see more specimens of known identity birds, but uh, my belief that key, the males have blacker hoods with paler backs, more tannish, so the contrast with the hood is greater. <coughs> and the sides aren't particularly cinnamon, they're paler. And panosis is clearly more richly colored and that's evident from the specimens. Okay. So here are the two subspecies within the um, uh, Northern Baja, Baja California Norte. The Sierra Juarez and the Sierra Pard Pedro Martir are not, not that far apart, 40, 50 miles at most for the breeding juncos. And keep in mind again that some treat the more southerly one with the pink sided junco, Townsend Eye, which we think is an error. Next image. And those are unknown for California. So it's a ball. I've never seen either one to my knowledge. So let's look at this a bit. Um, I'm not certain about the Thurberi, the second one, but you can, whatever it is, it's certainly paler than the very, very dark and richly colored oregonus. Remember these birds we don't have in Southern California, or at least they're rare. Um, and so it's coastal BC. Uh, they winter down to about Monterey. What's labeled, uh, in, so you can see variation, but, but Penosis, the third one down, is clearly more richly colored on the back uh, than the uh, birds adjacent to it with more cinnamon colored sides. Next image. And the back color. 
this gets us into what does tannish mean versus coffee brown. Um, coffee brown probably means you've put some cremora and the um, or cream in your coffee. Just how much cream? I see a comment coming in from Mark. We're comparing. Uh, I'm going. We're looking at males here. But look how ruddy that back is on the oregonus and how cinnamon colored, very ruddy the penosis is. This leaves us to what we're still searching. What is Thurberi and what is Schufeld dye? If Phil Unit were here, I'm sure he would have uh, comments. Again, look at the rich cinnamon sides on the Oregonus. Next image. So somewhat of the, the range is here. That's the Pacific Northwest. So in the Southern Oregon, Northern California is Thurberi. Uh, coastal Northwest Oregon, Western Washington, probably into BC is Similimus, formerly thought of as Schufeld eye until the problem with the type specimen. <coughs> and the interior Northwest is um, Schufeld eye, formerly that's Ridgeways, Montanas. If you're confused, I don't blame you. It took me quite a good while to figure out what the hell was going on. And from a California perspective, Thurberize surrounds, this is the breeding range now, how Thurberize surrounds Penosis. And remember, Penosis is largely resident. All the subspecies group integrate, subspecies groups integrate around the edges, except maybe uh, Akenai white winged um, and it shows you once you get into the north south ranges of central Nevada you start picking up the typical caniceps the northern gray headed next image at a AOS meeting this um, this year was a talk on uh, dark-eyed juncos with Alyssa Yang, who's a former WFO scholar, and Phil Unit and Nick Mason. That gives some of the characters. Separating these out, I'll note, just note that uh, Patton et al., which Phil Unit is also an author, Birds of the Salton Sea, he changed some of the color terminology from 2007 to 2003 to 2021 in describing Thurberi. So if Phil's changing color terminology, then you can see how we're floundering around. But that shows you basically, uh, here he recognizes Similimus, uh, coastal Oregon, and then Oregonus. And you can see a large part of the interior range within the Oregon group, Schufeldi, is what uh, brings, we think, a lot of birds down to the interior, well, eastern California. It's the abundant one, by the way, in northern Arizona and the forest there in the winter. And Pinosis and then Thurberi everywhere else breeding in California. So we won't get into this and take the time, but they quantify the back color, hood color, in each of the subspecies. I just, John, I just wanted to pipe in here that, that here, don't worry about any of these charts, but the point being that they used uh, colorimetric techniques. They used the actual spectrophotometer and essentially every color is translated to a series of, of numbers that can be quantitatively an analyzed. So don't worry about what they're showing here, but it's a way to get around that confusion of, of terms and adjectives like coffee and rich and cinnamon and that sort of thing. So hopefully this will be published at some point. And they, they did recommend or at least suggest that some subspecies are probably uh, not valid or shouldn't be recognized, including the Similimus versus Schufeldt eye. And as John mentioned, Schufeldt eye would have priority. So 
hopefully with this kind of quantitative analysis, we can get rid of some of the confusion by just get rid of, getting rid of some of the names. Okay, go. That's it. Go ahead, John. All right. Um, I'll just add that from the basis of specimens from Salton Sea area where um, juncos are overall rather uncommon in the winter, that within the Oregon group, Phil estimated that 75, if you include similimus within uh, Schufeldi, that some 75% of the birds there are not Thurberi within the Oregon group. Now, keep in mind up here in Eastern Inyo County, juncos are probably 10 times as numerous. So it gives you an idea as the, the number of Schufeldi that are wintering in California and how that's reflected in the coast. No doubt Schufeldides are getting to the coastal flocks, you know, to Junco flocks, say in the San Fernando Valley and elsewhere. To what determination, we don't know. The lab ought to have a Junco once we determine how to identify them, much as you did with um, Kinesin's bells and sagebrush sparrows, start trying to determine the percentage of the, within the Oregon flocks, what percentage are Schufeldi versus Thurberi. And if you merge Similimus in with Schufeldi, it makes the task easier. So this to me, here's a female bird. It doesn't have a blackish or even a dark slate hood. The sides are ri pretty rich cinnamon, whatever you want to call them, close to a pink sided color, but the, the head's too dark for pink sided and uh, the color doesn't extend far enough into the underparts. But I don't believe this is Thurberi. And it's also from Portal. Most of the Thurberi in Arizona or in Western Arizona, uh, they said particularly Southwest Arizona, according to Phillips et al, 64. Next image. Del Kimball got a picture of these from, uh, from his place in the Antelope Valley. Uh, one of them has a pretty rich cinnamon back. Um, Kimball, you wanna add anything else about that? I don't see very cinnamon sides. Uh, the bird on the back looks yeah. tannic. Bird on the right doesn't have a very black hood, but it has pretty tannish back. You want to set us? Yeah, well, they're Oregon, they're Oregon juncos. I got that far. And of course, some of the variation you're seeing is male, female, like the left hand bird on the left, and the bird at the feet are likely females. But yeah, I mean, just you see more variation than this, and I'm not willing to put any names on them. Yes. We, we promised to bring complete confusion on the subject of Oregon juncos, but that's one of our tasks of something we want to figure out. Now to make this pertinent, uh, notice the date this was photographed. This is this morning. And I was getting, this is my uh, second and third junco of the winter here. So the first one I saw was the bird on top. And uh, I was really impressed with the back color was pretty pale tan with a really sharp contrast with the black hood and a really pale wash color on the sides and flanks. It's mid-October, the bird should be really fresh um, and therefore should be, um, you know, not worn or anything. So I assume that was Thurberi and then somewhat later found a, what I believe was a female Schufeld eye with pretty rich cinnamon flanks uh, the head stopped and there was a male with it, which I was unable to photograph um, that had a, a black as should, but not nearly as black as Thurberized. So it met some of the criteria. I include the upper right picture. As you know, when you flush a junco and see it fly, you see white outer tail feathers. That's a great field mark. And as you read through Miller, that'll talk about the amount of white varies by subspecies and subspecies group, but not on the outer tail feather. So on the bird on the left, you'll see the whole tail looks white underneath because you're seeing the outer tail feathers fold or R6 fold from either side. So you're seeing the outer tail feather, uh, but how often are you gonna get a study where it spreads its tail like that so you can see R6 and R5, the outermost tail feather in the next one, show a lot of white. 
R4 is important as to the amount of white, um, but that's an in-hand character. For instance, pink-sided and uh, dorsalis, I believe, show a little more extra white. And that's true whether you, if you're looking at a warbler with a distinctive tail pattern, unless the tail spreads, you're seeing the outer tail feather from each side, or R6. So anyway, that's my belief. I, I saw three juncos today here, and if I'm correct, two thirds of them were Schufeldi. The junco I had, my first junco about a week ago, I believed was Thurberi too. But when I was looking at them last winter, I felt 90 to 95% of them were Schufeldi and not Thurberi, even though Thurberi nests within five miles of my house up the canyon. Next image. So as we get into the slate colored group, this is the widespread, the dominant subspecies group over much of North America. As Kimball pointed out from Western Alaska, across much of Canada uh, and down in the Appalachians, a poorly differentiated subspecies Carolinensis is pretty much restricted from the Appalachians to, from Pennsylvania to, um, Northeast Georgia, Northern Georgia, <coughs> where the Appalachians end. Uh, it's a little paler headed. The characteristic of high malice, the males have a slightly darker head to the body, more evenly colored in Carolinensis. Carolinensis appears largely resident, so not something to worry about in the West. It has the concave pattern rather than the convex shape of the Oregon hood. Females are more brown, brownish. That's not indicative of an organ. Males are more slaty gray. We have big flocks of juncos here. And it's a lot of fun if you look, have a flock of 70 or something. Uh, three or four of them will be slate colored. That proportion drops significantly as you head to the coast, um, where there are fewer slate coloreds. And that's true even in Northwest California. But we have a pretty high proportion. Well, it's you know, three to 5% are slate coloreds. Next image. Advancing right along. We don't know if this is a female, but they can show a little brown. Uh, Kimball put this in. Notice the white tips, particularly to the median coverts, um, which you could interpret as whitish wing bars, perhaps a feature of white wing, but the head's way too dark. So white tips of the covers doesn't mean a white wing junco, the, sub, the Black Hills subspecies Aikenai which is casual in California. Um, very few show white tips of the coverts, but if you look through enough of them, it's, it's not that unusual. Another male, slight color. So now we're into an issue of um, something else we don't fully understand. There are two subspecies. One is, um, apart from Carolinensis, the widespread dominant high malice and cis montana, sometimes referred to the English name, the Cassier Junco, basically of the Canadian Rockies. And it tends to show almost an Oregon hood color that's separated from the back and more of a slightly more, at least on the back uh, in an Oregon like fashion. Um, I, Unit or rather a patent at all in their salt and sea books that thinks that 90% of the um, slate colored juncos are cis montanus. And if that's true, that seems amazing to me because they have a very small range as opposed to the dominant subspecies, which goes to Western Alaska. Uh, and then the cis montanus is really, in some ways, could be thought of as an intergrade population, intergrade being meaning between subspecies rather than hybrids. 
but exactly what Cis Montanus is is still of a mystery, at least to us. Next image. So a larger subspecies that's found um, breeds uh, Southeast Montana, Eastern Wyoming, and then uh, the Black Hills of South Dakota. Normally th people think of them as the Black Hills. It's larger than the slate colored and paler with a bigger bill. And in a junco flock, they really stand out as larger. Uh, this one notice was in uh, Inyo County, Debbie Parker found it. Um, it struck me and there was slate colored in the flock was the paler color and the larger size, bigger, longer bill. It does have more white in the outer tail feathers. Now they, that's where they breed. They winter typically in the front range down to Northern New Mexico, but do stray west to um, Northern Arizona, um, it, even to Tucson. And um, also, uh, I believe there's three records for California, including this wintering bird uh, that Larry actually drove up from LA to photograph. So this is Akenai. White winged junco is not perhaps the best name because the tips aren't all that obvious to the wing coverts, but I can't think of a better name offhand. Black Hills junco. And finally, pink sided junco. If you really see a pink sided, they're quite a stunner. Uh, pink's a pretty good name but it's, it's a mauve pink, um, a rich, rich pink or pink beige. And it's a distinctly different color from, from female organs. That, but in addition to the color of the sides and flanks, they bulge out way into the underparts. So if you're looking at a bird from a profile, it's hard to see the white in the belly because it's limited to the center. You have to have it facing you front on. And in a decent percentage of the um, pink sideds, the color extends all the way across the breast. So just below the gray hood. And then you look at the back and the back is, it's not a rich reddish color like within the gray headed birds, but it contrasts nicely with a, a blue gray hood like within the dorsalis, the red backed and the gray headed. And like those, it also has blackish lores. A little more white in the tail, and they're a good size bird within the juncos. As Philip says, uh, they more properly fill the hand, like with dorsalis. Um, the pink sided, it breeds up to the Cypress Hills on the Saskatchewan Alberta border, winters commonly throughout. Uh, the, the central and southern Rockies and the northern Mexico. It's pretty rare in California, though regular on the east side of the state, uh, few, certainly fewer than um, colored. Here you can see how the pink extends way into the middle of the underparts. I call it one of the most chronically misidentified uh, taxon, most chronically misidentified in the state in part because it's just been rampantly misportrayed in field guides. They're, what's illustrated are not pink-sided juncos in most guides. So here, for instance, are many people's classic pink-sided junco, but note how dark the head is. And the pinkish is very confined on the sides um, with a lot of white showing. And this is what a lot of illustrations show for pink-sided, but it's just probably, it's probably, uh, uh, a Schufeldi, Oregon. So this goes back to the first field guide I was using, the Western Peterson, pink-sided, Mernsai. Actually, Peterson gives the scientific name there, um, but that's not a pink-sided junco, nor is what was in Byers and uh, Curson, or Curson Byers, um, Byers at all. That's not a pink sided. The Sibley guide gets some of the elements right, but notice how the white bulges the wrong way rather than bulges out. He has the white 
or rather the pink bulging out, he has the white bulging in. And that color is almost, it's too orange. It's not that dark uh, beigey buff color. So when you're using field guides to identify pink-sided juncos, you're gonna get in trouble. And yet alone, I have been in the breeding grounds of pink-sided junco, like in Southeast Idaho near the Wyoming border. And there are lots of juncos and they all look perfectly typical for pink-sided. So I guess the specimens are misidentified that what people uh, illustrated. Here's a question I just saw come in from Mark about gen telling genders. Um, I think the males have a slightly bluer head. So Kimball showed what I would have guessed was a male initially and then a female within the pink side. Do we want to take a moment to back up Kimball on those or maybe we're in the advancing? No, well, that's not a pink sided, right? So Mark, my guess that's a female. And the one before, they're pretty similar to the sexes. And then the one before is about as obvious as a pink sided gets. We advance back one more. Not that one, maybe one, I would call that a female too. Go back one more, two, two back. That one. That's my favorite pink sided, the more obvious, the one most obvious. That one's got nice blackish lures too. Anyway, let's advance on. Remember the someplace Townsend I within the pink sided group, but we disagree with that. I'm gonna turn this over to Kimball to get to some more muddling of uncertainties. Kimball? Yeah, okay, thanks, John. And I promise to muddle quickly because we're really on our last little group of sort of similar uh, text of Junko. So this is the gray headed Junko, uh, which until, um, well, was considered a separate species up until like, I think it was into the early 80s, was it? I don't know. That John will hey, remember, but 1982 in the right, just before the, the sixth, sixth edition, the last supplement right. for the sixth edition. And as a separate species, it included two subspecies, Taniceps and then Dorsalis or redback junco, which we'll get to in just a second. Um, that they, of course, are all considered part of the dark eyed junco complex now, but um, there's a lot of confusion and perhaps some alternate possible treatments. But the gray headed junco is a very distinctive bird with a very, very pure gray head and underparts, really an entirely gray bird with a bright rufous back patch. Um, the bill is pale pink. There's a nice dark lower area. And so they're, they're really very distinctive. Where it gets a bit muddled, is there they do intergrade with Oregon type junco. So you can see a bird that looks pretty good for gray headed, but has a bit of brownish pinkish, just a touch of it on the sides and flanks. These could well be intergrades, um, which they're certainly known to do. So this is essentially a great basin uh, breeder that winters over much of the Southwest, It'd be very common in Arizona, for example, but generally quite uncommon in California. Um, both on the on the deserts and even less common on the coast. Pretty much here in the winter when the big or the big junco flocks are present, um, can arrive as early as the end of September, beginning of October. And there was a really unusual bird up in San Luis Obispo County this year in early June, an extremely late bird. But um, they're, they're very, very distinctive juncos. So the problem comes in when we start talking about gray-headed um, the dorsalis versus canisef, but do keep in mind also that they do integrate with Oregon juncos. So just another gray headed, um, one of a couple we had during the winter. We've already had one in our yard this winter. Um, again, just very gray below the white belly, distinct um, red back patch. Um, so very, very distinctive junco. But then we get to this form or uh, subspecies, which is Dorsalis or the red-backed junco. This is Larry Sansoni's photo of the bird that was in a small park out here in Palmdale last November, um, which is probably the first well-documented one for California. We wrote up a little note on that in, for Western birds. So 
These are thought to be largely resident, although they will move somewhat. So they breed across the Mogollon Rim from the Wallapai Mountains of Northwest Arizona, kind of in a slant across North and North Central Arizona into parts of uh, Central New Mexico and in the Guadalupe Mountains, the extreme, um, that North end of the, the part of Texas that sticks out to the West. Um, so they show some altitudinal movements a bit and will move a few hundred miles, uh, up to a few hundred miles or sometimes in other mountain ranges where they don't breed, but they're not considered to be long distance migrants. And that's why they don't occur much or have rarely, or perhaps only once occurred in California. So the main distinctions from the Caniceps gray-headed junco is the bill color. Uh, the bird's a little larger. The bill is relatively larger and has much uh, slaty on the culmen. So it's essentially a dark culmen. And the bill itself is a bit less pink, a bit more of a kind of a pale silvery gray. The, the lowers, if anything, look even more distinctly blackish because the head's a bit paler and the throat and underparts are a paler shade of grayish white than in the, than in the Caniceps gray-headed junco. The back patch always strikes us as brighter and more extensive. I, I'm not sure that's real. It may just be because it contrasts more with that pure paler gray. Rare individuals can have a touch of, of color coming onto the, the uh, greater coverts and tertials, but um, that's, that's probably only a minority of birds. But the redback junco is a distinct taxon and some, certainly something to watch for in winter junco flocks. Um, the breeding distribution, again, uh, this doesn't have the Wallapai Mountains, which would be even farther to the upper left of the, the screen. This is from Miller's time, and they seem to have more recently colonized the Wallapais, but you can see them. The lower right-hand most red dot is the Dorsalis breeding population in the Guadalupe Mountains of Texas. To the south of them is the breeding range of yellow-eyed junco. There are areas east of Phoenix you can go and stand on one mountain, um, as, as um, Alden Miller did, and see, be in the middle of Dorsalis juncos and be looking across to the next mountain south in the breeding range of yellow-eyed juncos. And then up to the upper right, those green dots, including the one I had to stick in there uh, because I forgot to color it in, is breeding range of Caniceps, which of course goes north from there up through the Great Basin. So you can see the separation there. But of interest in that blue triangle on the Kaibab Plateau is an area where Miller documented a number of intergrades between Dorsalis and Caniceps. And you see some dots over in Western New Mexico of intergrades as well, although the number there is, is, is very, very small, perhaps only one or two real intergrades there. Um, but there is a very small zone of intergradation, but certainly not a large hybrid swarm at all. So this kind of raises the question, since Dorsalis in many ways phenotypically is intermediate between dark-eyed juncos and yellow-eyed juncos, or in some sense, it's a yellow-eyed junco with a dark eye. Uh, and since there's such limited interbreeding with caniceps, um, how does one treat taxonomically the red-backed or Dorsalis Junko, and these, these are questions still being asked. Uh, this is just from Miller's monograph, and it shows the bill colors of typical Caniceps gray headed, the numbers one through three, and then some presumed intergrades, which would be four, five, six, and seven, and then the remaining ones, eight and nine, and presumably 10 also would be the typical. This is just looking down on the upper mandible or culmen. So the whole bill isn't dark, of course, but you can see that difference in the amount of dark on the bill. So that same bird in Palmdale. So the bill is almost more of a silvery gray color with a distinctly dark culmen and paler grayish white on the underpart. So again, a very distinctive taxon and, and very interesting in terms of its relationships. Um, just again, a taxonomic note here, it's, as we've mentioned, it's been treated as a subspecies of dark-eyed junco. Of course, if you go far enough into the past, some treated it um, as a subspecies and lumped it in with the yellow-eyed junco. Um, yellow eyes have expanded their range a bit in Southwest New Mexico recently, where they've hybridized with red-backed juncos. 
hybridization does not necessarily connote um, close evolutionary relationship, but it is a hint that there might be some close relationship there. So that, that hybridization is not surprising and I suppose could be used by some as an argument that perhaps the red back junco is, is better placed with the yellow eyes. But on the other hand, it does not have a yellow eye. It's got a dark eye. It doesn't have a yellowish mandible. It's got more of a very pale pink or pink, grayish pink or silvery gray mandible. Um, genetic studies actually show it to be um, sort of perhaps closer to the yellow eyed junco than to the dark eyed junco group, although more study is certainly needed. And again, as we mentioned, there's that small intergradation zone with the Caniceps gray headed juncos just, just in that Kaibab Plateau area of Northern Arizona. So lots more to be done with that taxon and that dorsalis, but it's a very interesting bird. And then here, of course, is a true yellow-eyed junco. Remember, this bird is found all the way from Arizona and New Mexico, um, all the way to down through southern Mexico with closely related forms considered the same species in Chiapas and Guatemala as well. So not only is the eye a the, the brilliant yellow, but the lower mandible is more of a yellow or yellowish pink color. Um, and notice that the rusty of the back uh, is fairly extensive on the greater coverts and the tertials as well. And that's a character shown to a very slight degree in just a few redback juncos, but it's, it's typical of essentially all uh, yellow-eyed juncos. As we mentioned early on, the songs of yellow-eyed juncos are much more complex than most dark-eyed junco songs, although redbacks might approach them in complexity. Um, so again, very distinctive taxon, our northern subspecies, which you see in the U.S. is Paliatus, um, but the species is Junco Dionotus. So many questions still to be answered there. And then finally, just this is John's picture of a volcano Junco um, from Costa Rica. It's a very a highland bird just on a few volcanic summits there. Uh, it's got a yellow eye, like a yellow eye Junco, but a streaked back, kind of a zona trichia like back and no white in the tail, which of course is unique within the genus Junko. So presumably this is sort of the ancestral Junko or the ancestral Junko looked something like this, but I wouldn't uh, spend time looking through winter Junko flocks in California for one of these. And um, finally, and then I'll let John make some closing comments. We just wanted to emphasize a handful of things First of all, just keep in mind that there are areas of intergradation. By that, we mean mixing between subspecies um, that occur between nearly all adjacent subspecies within the dark-eyed junco. So you're going to get, for example, gray-headed juncos, caniceps, integrate with Oregon juncos to the west, uh, for example, in extreme western uh, Nevada and perhaps places like the White Mountains. They integrate with pink-sided juncos at the north end of their range. And as we just showed you very locally with red-back juncos um, in the Kaibab Plateau at the southern end of gray-headed range. And this kind of integration again happens among all of these. And that means, of course, in the field, you're gonna see birds that you just can't place because they're integrates uh, between subspecies groups. And then, of course, it's even more uh, difficult when you're talking about integrates within, say, the Oregon group, where, um, you know, we can't even, I think one of our bottom lines for the talk tonight is we can't tell the subspecies within the Oregon group apart in the field with much confidence. So how on earth are we going to distinguish integrates there? So we really think that integrates within the Orig Oregon subspecies group are certainly not field identifiable, and it's really kind of questionable whether most of the Oregon subspecies would be field identifiable. I think that nominate or the oregonus from the Pacific Northwest with its deep rich colors would probably stand out should one appear among our expected ones. But when you get into things like Thurberi versus Similimus versus Schufeld eye, um, it's not easy and perhaps not really doable. So I'll leave this slide up and let John make some final comments. I was just going to close out the gray-headed or the um, 
dorsalis yellow eyed issue. I think it was probably 30 years ago, I had the energy to hike up to the bowl in the Guadalupe Mountains of West Texas and heard what sounded to me like yellow eyed juncos. And I thought, well, they're not supposed to be here. I've never seen yellow eyed juncos really rare in Texas. So I played yellow eyed junco tape and bang, birds came attacking. And I thought, oh boy, here come yellow eyed juncos, except they had dark eyes. And all the birds I had that day singing sounded like yellow eyed juncos to me, and they were all dorsalis, which got me thinking about the issue what really is dorsalis? And it's resident, much like yellow eyed is. So when you read Miller, you, you think, okay, so maybe caniceps that fits with the dark eyed, and dorsalis is a dark eyed yellow eyed. But, um, Miller talks the hybrid areas, the Kaipab Plateau area. Northern Arizona, indeed, he had collected a number of hybrids. Uh, the Zuni Mountains, which he lists, are um, he had three: one a typical Dorsalis, one a um, Caniceps, and one a hybrid. And then the San Mateo Mountains to the east of there, he had only Dorsalis, but speculated that might be a hybrid zone. But, but it still comes down to what is about the Kaibab birds. And then I started wondering. I really haven't been in the range of caniceps, the gray headed, that much to know is there variation in their song or do they trail like typical Oregon juncos? Somebody could, living in Colorado, could answer that in a heartbeat or if we'd taken enough time to listen to Zeno Canto. But back to our take home messages, we need to learn more about Oregon's and firm up the colors. A trip to, I probably Phil has assigned all of the specimens. In the San Diego Museum. So a trip down to San Diego and have Phil teach us about separating Schupeld eye from Thurber eye would be helpful. Uh, we need to figure out what's going on, what is really dorsalis. And lastly, the, the most easily solvable issue, because as far as I'm concerned, it is solved, is knowing a real pink sided junco from everything illustrated that's a female organ. Um, and we're sorry we're muddled in giving a partial um, partial answers and confusion. Kimball, you wanna add anything to the confusion? No, I think I've added enough confusion all along this evening, so I'll leave it at that. But we're happy to entertain any questions that have been entered into the Q&A. We're done. Thanks, Kimball. Thank you all for putting up with this. Thanks for <laughs> <Yeah>. the question. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, we really so enjoyed much. it. Go ahead, Mark. So, so we have, uh, since the last thing you mentioned was the uh, uh, illustration of pink sided juncos, um, we have a question from Lance. What about the National Geographic guide? Is that uh, the pink sided <laughs> junco is there? Is that uh, accurate? As the sun comes up in the east, I made sure that one was based on photos done very carefully. <laughs> I'm happy with that one, but that seems a little self-serving. <laughs> <laughs> but you asked me directly. I don't know how else to feel. The issue. <laughs> I think Tom Schultz. Okay, thank you. <laughs> might... um, and Ken asked... Um, I guess camping in uh, Grand Canyon, North Rim of the Grand Canyon in 1992, uh, were those red back juncos? <laughs> no, I don't, don't think. I think I think they would either be. Uh, well, I could look at Phillips Kimball. Do they kind of is it breed on the North Rim? The Kaibab Plateau. Well, is farther east. Kaibab Plateau is a hybrid area. Yeah. So they're both there. They could be both or integrates. Right. So you were in a good place to investigate that. So go back there and try again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Miller got to, you know, someone ought to go reconfirm what Miller did. I mean, but if before any splitting's done, the Kaibab Plateau is the key place. Plus, they're pretty squirrels there too, right? I mean, a subspecies of the Ebert's squirrel. 
Yeah, Lance has a question about songs, and we've been characterizing Oregon songs as simple trills and contrasting with yellow-eyed and, and some red-backed, at least, that have much more complex songs. And Lance makes a very good point that simple trill might be oversimplifying it because there's certainly variation, not only in the quality of the trills, but sometimes um, there can be different sort of phrases or, or different, there can be changes in, in pitch or quality of the notes within the trill. So um, I, Lance, I'm sure you're correct. Uh, I, I, we will love to listen to some more complex Oregon songs but I'm pretty confident that that complexity is not the same as what you would hear in, for example, a yellow-eyed Junko song, which is, is very, very different. And or Dar Darcellus. Right. I guess Ken is going to the Grand Canyon tomorrow, so. Yes. Uh, well, that'll, know. that'll be good. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think that does it for questions. Oh, we had something pop in. We have something from Ted. Um, let's see, my, uh, Ted asked, my understanding from this talk is that the main point against gray-headed being part of dark-eyed junco is the eye color, but other species have different eye-colored subspecies like bowtail grackle. So Ted asked, what am I missing? <laughs> Oh, we don't know what they're telling. Um, well, it might be a dark-eyed, yellow-eyed junker, but but how they fit in. But then, what do you do with Miller's all the hybrids he got on the Kaibab Plateau? It's the area people want to investigate. And what exactly? Yeah. If Dorsalis, and we don't, we did directly say everything I heard in the Guadalupe sounded like yellow-eyed junkers based on my one half day up there, but. Uh, across the dorsalis has a big range it goes to the wallapais from um, from the guadalupe mountains 100 miles east of el paso all the way to the wallapai mountains near kingman arizona is there variation within the song of dorsalis geographical variation mm -hmm. or for that matter what do all the caniceps sound like say the ones from southern utah any of those start sounding like dorsalis so Ted, Ted, I would throw another another wrench into this whole conversation too, which is with the known interbreeding of yellow-eyed and red-backed recently in in New Mexico. Um, it's not inconceivable that perhaps the best approach would be to lump all these juncos, including yellow-eyed, as one species. That would be one extreme. The other extreme would be to consider yellow-eyed separate. Um, in fact. Um, it, Chiapas separate, Guatemalan separate, red-backed and all these other groups separate. So we don't know. Part of it is what do song differences mean? Um, we know songs are learned. Uh, so the genetic work also has to be a big component of it. We know that red-backed essentially is genetically somewhat intermediate between the dark eyes and the yellow eyes. So um, whereas gray-headed seems to be well, somewhat closer to all the rest of the dark eyes. It's very, it's very complicated, and that's why these haven't been resolved in the 80 years since Miller, and before that, and since then. So, good question, and we'll give the same answer we've given all night. We don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Lily asks. Um, the Oregon Museum specimens had yellow bills. Do the yellow bills make them distinguishable. I don't know how much faith I'd put in bill color. I don't know how much faith I put in the bill color of museum specimens since that changes um, subtly to drastically over time or usually really soon after death. Um, so none, none of the Oregon subspecies should have yellow bills. I mean, it could be kind of slightly orangish pink to paler pink and some variation, but I, I would be very careful about interpreting bill color from museum specimens unless it was annotated on the label somehow. Okay, uh, no, interesting. Um, 
Lance asks, are juncos other than Oregon's moving into urban areas like say in Denver or Salt Lake City? Well, let me counter, with a, question. Let me counter with a question to um, Lance, because he's originally out of the East. Um, Myrtle warblers, uh, you know, the Coronada myrtles, yellow rumped warblers, moved into Christmas tree farms in various places in the lower mountains of the Appalachians and things. And so I'm wondering, um, do the, I wonder if juncos have occupied some of those Christmas tree farms. I didn't check the, like the Pennsylvania Atlas. There's a, a very uh, good birds of Ligonier County the powder mill based sort of inspired by the powder mill banding operation in Southwest Pennsylvania. And there's one mountaintop that has Carolinensis breeding slate colored juncos. But I would think with modified landscapes, birds could move in. Now to totally change the subject, the reason we don't have spotted doves because of the exploding urban population of nesting Cooper's hawks. And yet alone the Cooper's hawk in Cuba that so we treat as a separate species, Goonlock's hawk, looks and sounds just like a Cooper's hawk. And yet they're still rare as can be. They're not moving into urban areas, particularly at all to nest. Still really hard to find. So just because Oregon's are moving into lowland areas of Southern California, for whatever reason, doesn't mean uh, slate colors have done much of that in the East. Or Kenniseps. And Penosis certainly hasn't moved much. Seems to be a stable taxon and pretty confined. I looked at the map, you know, they're basically south of Monterey and north locally East Bay, but I'm not sure all the Bay Area birds are Penosis. Um, certainly Monterey to Northern San Luis Obispo County are. Mm -hmm. But they look pretty distinctive. Anything else to folks? Um, oh, we have another question from uh, from Ken. I just looked at a photo um, in Siskiyou County, August 2015, and the reddish color covers the belly. Is pink sighted possible or do Oregon's get weird colors? <laughs> I wouldn't. Pink -sided. Weird colors. Yeah, I'll say they get weird colors. Um, pink side gray head. Uh, hybridizes, um, integrates rather, and they're kind of a colorful combination. <laughs> uh, pink side that we don't see till mid October. Well, let me throw one other interesting thing out. You know, people go to the South Hills for this crossbill split, which, by the way, I voted against um, the cash of crossbill. But when I went to the Cache of Crossbills also found in the Albion Mountains to the east. Now in the South Hills, it's Kenniseps Grayhead. East of the Albion Mountains, it's all Kenniseps Grayheaded. Or I'm sorry, Pink Sighted, Mern's Eye. But in the Albion Mountains, I saw in mid-August, so all sort of breeding birds, I saw what looked like pure pink sided and pure Kenniseps and wasn't seeing any integrates. So I thought. Are these two recognizing each other as separate? How come I'm not seeing more hybrids? But that's about the basis of two hours of looking at 30 birds. What the grad student ought to go up there during the breeding season and see who's pair bonding with whom. <laughs> so there's a lot of junco mystery. That's another one. What happens with pink sided where it meets um, caniceps, for instance? I mean, obviously they hybridized or integrate, but to what degree? And I'm sure there's uh, a barrel full of other mysteries in the Juncos to figure out. And they're so common. And if you live in places like North or South Dakota and you enjoy looking at passerines, most of them are Juncos. They're common and, and so much to learn about them. It's not like, you know, those Bell sagebrush sparrows you're all trying to do. You had to play tapes and try to <laughs> photograph. Here they're at your feeders and in flocks. <laughs> and a number, and we say, oh, an Oregon junco. So let's go back to our take home messages. Learn pink sided, 
we got to figure out yellow eye dorsalis and how that fits in. And let's figure out at least, you know, uh, how the Schufeld eye, Thurber eye ratios differ in um, Southern California, interior versus the coast. And a trip to the San Diego Natural History Museum and have Phil teach us, followed by another talk with specimens all lined up. Look at the 2015 issue of Western Birds, how it ought to be done the way Dan taught us, like female bird thrushes in the winter and Pacific wrens and um, go back to the museum skins that have been properly curated and assigned. Uh, so, I don't know if that qualifies as grant. <laughs> <laughs> Words to absolutely live by. Thank you very much, John. We, uh, you know, um, sometimes you, you do, you get carried away with different things and all that. And, uh, but uh, definitely something to keep in mind. And hopefully we have the manpower to actually look at Junkos. And, and uh, that'd be exciting. That'd be good. Anyways, I think we're out of questions. I just want to thank John. I want to add one more thing is sure. People look to give definitive answers. And we try to do talks like that, but Good sometimes point. it's more interesting to say, this is why we're screwed up and uncertain. <laughs> Except that we think that the popular wisdom's all not right and we need to do more. Mm -hmm. So we sort of gave a muddled talk. I mean, some people probably just, well, I said I'm not looking at another chunk of it. But we don't mean to be discouraged. But that's part of the exciting thing for us. I'm determined to learn before I check out. Um, and Kimball and I will, me, will continue to think about the issue for a while, we'll probably with the same degree of speed that we've done it the last few decades. <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you very much for really. Thank you, everybody. Talk. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we'll talk. see you all next week for Birds in Flight with Ryan Terrell. And I want to thank John Kimball for a very entertaining talk, at least. Maybe not as enlightening as Dowager's, but definitely entertaining. <laughs> Thanks, all. Thanks for watching. Well, Thanks thank for you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for questions, too. Uh, for Mark Holmgren and Lance, always yeah. we, we appreciate that setting us straight, and uh, that's part of why these things are so valuable, is getting an interchange of ideas. And I'm happy to admit when I'm wrong, or in this case, I don't even know enough to say whether I'm wrong or not. <laughs> <laughs> I might be. Sounds Thanks. good. Thank you again, both Kimball and okay. all the previous things together and john all your all your knowledge in this area so well i was inspired to go out and photograph junkos a few hours ago it, <laughs> it can, I, it, I immediately drew conclusions based on three birds <laughs> <laughs> that i looked at the samples yeah. and those three <laughs> thanks okay <laughs> bye bye good night Thank everyone you so much. we'll see you, we'll see everyone next week good night Hey, goodbye. Good Go Dodgers. <laughs>